Hey, and welcome back. This week I'll be showing you how I throw and trim my stoneware jars. As per usual, this process begins with the wedging of the clay. This is a high iron clay body, which is meant for reduction firing. Lots of the older bags I've had in stock are too firm now, so I've been mixing it half-half with fresher, softer reclaim. The process of spiral wedging folds the clay into ever-decreasing spirals within itself forcing out air and causing all the clay to become homogenous. It's a tricky process to learn, and it's one that took me a long time, years in fact, but when the clay is in just the right consistency, spiral wedging is one of the easiest ways of wedging your clay, apart from the obvious use of a pug mill, which is definitely on my wish list for next year. To finish up the spiral, I gradually wedge with less and less force, whilst rolling it backwards and forwards to close up the shape. Then it's time to weigh out the clay. Each of these is weighed out at about one pound, or 453 grams if you're using the metric system. I find potters tend to use both imperial and metric. As I was being taught ceramics, my tutors were constantly switching between the two, using both pound weights, two pound weights, grams, ounces, and so on. And whilst it is confusing, there's no denying the fact that a pound weight is a very useful weight of clay. So nowadays I just find myself using a mixture of the two. Once the lumps of clay are weighed out, I give each one a quick little spiral wedge, just to bring it all together. And although mostly hidden by my hands here, the process is essentially the same as spiralling a much larger lump of clay. These jars do benefit too with a bit of extra wedging. You'll see later that I collar in the rim and creating a small step which acts as the gallery for the lid. This process exacerbates any undulations or wobbles in the clay, so making sure it's well wedged and well coned up is really important. As for throwing these, they're a relatively simple shape essentially just a tall straight cylinder which I then indent on the top. The clay is pulled up to my throwing gauge which is the point I've just tipped over there. This tool measures both the height and width of the pots and is arguably one of my most important tools for repetition throwing. Of course I don't have the dimensions for the first pot so usually I throw the first piece and then measure it with a ruler and then once everything's correct I'll set my pointer. Whilst throwing these I constantly keep the top part of the wall quite thick. This is for two reasons. The first being that I'm going to be pushing the clay at the top inward, so if it's too thin it can collapse or undulate unnecessarily. The rim also needs to stay thick, just simply for the strength of the vessel. As a jar, the lid is going to be removed and replaced often, so I don't want the rim to be too sharp, as it could be chipped quite easily. Once the walls of the pot hit the pointer, I use one finger just to lift it out of the way. In reality, I don't mind if the pots are a little bit taller or a little bit shorter than the pointer, as long as the overall shape is correct. Then I remove the skim of clay around the base. This neatens up the form, and it means I'll be able to get my brass kidney right down to the base to clean up the entirety of the walls later on. I'm not too concerned again about the throwing rings. As I'll be trimming these quite a lot later on, I'll be able to remove them, and it's not worth the time it might take now to get rid of them all, as it's much easier to do when the clay is leather hard and you're turning it. Here you can see my fingers pressing in the rim to make the indentation that forms the gallery. It's a simple procedure really. I use one wetted finger just to push from the outside while the fingers inside supports the walls from collapsing inward. Then I measure the internal diameter with a pair of calipers and chamois off the rim. These slightly enclosed forms lift off the wheel very easily, especially when the walls of the pot are scraped clean of any slip and my hands are relatively dry too. When I make these, I throw all the jars in one go and then I throw all the lids in one go. So it's especially important that during this whole process, my calipers don't move or shift. Even a change of a millimetre or so can cause a lot of extra work later on. When it comes to making the lids, I simply inverse my calipers measurements. And that way I can measure the external diameter of the flange of the lid. I also tend to give myself an extra millimetre or so. That way I can trim down the flange of the lid to perfectly fit the jars. It's always better to have slightly too much material to work with, rather than too little, as you can always subtract clay, but you can't add it back quite so easily. These lids are quick to make, they use much less clay, and as I don't really have to gain any height with this shape, the whole process only takes 40 or 50 seconds. The low mound of clay is drawn out, and then I separate the rim with one finger, much like I do the indent, on the top of the jars. The clay below is then compressed tightly together. And then I use my calipers to measure the reverse of the flange just to make sure that it fits well. These lids are trimmed a lot, so 
I don't mind too much if they're a little bit messy here and there, or if the flange isn't perfectly smooth. I'd rather throw them all quickly, as truthfully, lids aren't the most interesting pieces to make. The most important factor really is getting the diameter correct, and also getting the angles right, which you can see here, that I define with my metal kidney. I then remove quite a lot of clay from the underside of these, so there's ample space for my hands to get around to lift these off. I use the sharp edge on my slops bucket to remove most of the slip from my hands. Then it's just a matter of carefully grasping it with as much contact as possible and then lifting away. You might also notice that I spin the wheel at the exact same moment that I lift the lid away. This is just to break any seal there could be. I always throw a few extra lids, just in case I ruin a few when I'm trimming them. Once I've thrown everything, I'll let them dry slowly overnight with some plastic over top. Again, this really depends on the weather, how I treat the pots when they dry, or if my bisque kiln is going on overnight, I'll wrap them especially tight, as there's nothing worse than coming in the following morning, only to find all your thrown work too firm and bone dry and unusable. Ideally, when you're trimming jars and lids to fit one another, you want each component to be as similar to the other as possible. If one part is much drier than the other when you trim them, and they then dry at uneven rates, you can end up with one part that won't fit the other. The useful thing about my lids, and the bodies too, is that they both act as the chuck for the other. I begin by putting the lid down on the wheel, then I trim away just a little bit before testing the jar over top to make sure it fits. You don't want it to fit completely snugly, Rather, it's more helpful if there's a tiny amount of wiggle room, say a millimetre or so. If they fit too perfectly, you risk the two components becoming stuck as they dry out to bone dry. Once the lid fits, and I've neatened it up a little bit, I remove it and attach the jar component onto the wheel. I do this by rubbing the base with water and then rubbing it into place on the metal. The friction creates slip and this holds it firmly in place. But for some added security, I use a rubber kidney to squash down some of the clay and form a nice tight seal against the wheel head. Then it's just a matter of trimming the outside, smoothing off the walls, and removing some of the mass to make the overall weight of the pot a little lighter. This looped tungsten carbide trimming tool is one of my favorites. It's remained sharp through thousands of pots, although if I were to drop it, it would be ruined, as tungsten carbide is incredibly brittle. I've always been a potter who likes trimming. There are some out there who prefer throwing, others who prefer glazing, but I've always found turning to be the process I love the most. Once the walls are nice and straight, I just do a little bit of trimming on the top just to define the gallery section of the vessel. Then I can place the lid into the top and trim it in situ. The goal here is to trim the lid to match the diameter of the lower half of the jar. Although held firmly in place, I use my left hand to apply constant downward pressure during this process. The pressure exerted from the trimming tool outside is still enough to cause the lid to jump out of place if you were to potentially snag on something in the clay. Once the outside surface is done, I begin work on the top. I remove the wiring off marks, and I also trim a very slight concave surface. This provides a nice area for the glaze to pool in once it's fired. I then use the sharp edge of a flat metal kidney just to remove any of the turning marks and to burnish the surface nice and smooth. The glazes I use tend to hide many of the marks left in the clay so I don't worry too much about getting them absolutely pristine and perfect. At this stage almost all of the parts are done apart from the base but quickly I always flip over the lid on top to make sure that the flange is all neat and tidy. This is the most precarious part of the process, as there's nothing to stop the lid from simply flying off if there's too much pressure applied. After I've trimmed away any sharp edges, I use my fingertips like I would a metal kidney, just to burnish off the edges and make them smooth. To remove the jar, I use a potter's knife to skim underneath it until it pops off. And before I flip it back over so I can trim the base, I make sure to clean the wheel head so there's no burrs of clay that might stick back onto the lid. I give it a gentle tap centre to get it into place, 
and usually the weight of the whole vessel alone is enough to hold it firmly in place but sometimes I will use three small soft bits of clay placed around the lid just to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I trim a beveled edge onto the outer diameter of the foot and again I trim away the wiring off marks on the base. And again I'll use the metal kidney just to burnish off the surface, making it all smooth and nice to the touch. This is especially important on the base I think, as once fired it'll be the only remaining bare clay on the whole pot. You'll be able to see it, touch it, run your hands over it, so it has to be finished with the same quality as you would the rest of the piece. Finally, I stamp the pot. This is my signature, my maker's mark, and these ones are very special to me. I made them during my apprenticeship with Lisa Hammond at Mays Hill Pottery, and they were fired head first down in wadding in the soda kilns, which makes them unique and very sentimental objects to me. It's stamped in, and I rock it from corner to corner to ensure it leaves a good impression. And that's it. I give them a quick check over and make sure the lids fit, so I remove the lid and I place it down in a few different orientations to make sure it doesn't get stuck anywhere. Once placed down onto the wear boards, I make sure that I don't move the bottom part of the jar until they're bone dry, otherwise you risk scratching the neat bases and ruining them. As they dry over the coming days, I'll lift the lids off at random and twist them, changing their orientation just to make sure that none of them are getting stuck. And here's the finished version, coated with a white crackle glaze and reduction fired. There's still a lot that has to happen from the bone dry pot to what you see now, but hopefully I'll be able to show all of those processes in upcoming videos. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.